Hi everyone, thanks for checking out my talk. My name is Jay, and today I'll be talking about a paper from my PhD work with my advisors Mike Webster and Dustin Rubenstein. When we look across all the really incredible and immense variation in animal forms, what often pops out the most are cases of what we call exaggerated traits. And the classic explanation that most of us have heard is that these types of traits are often a result of what we call sexual selection, or competition for mates. But we also know that sexual selection is limited. There are so many examples of animals that don't follow its expectations. Social selection theory, proposed by Mary Jane West Eberhardt, seeks to broaden our scope of how competition can lead to the evolution of exaggerated traits. The theory incorporates many types of interaction, including sexual selection, and it's therefore incredibly rich and complex. Through the social selection framework, we can ask, what do animals compete for? Who or what lend its resource availability? And what types of competition lead to the evolution of exaggeration? Once we broaden the scope past competition for mates, separating the interwoven threads of different types of competition is a major challenge. This is where I'll bring in hummingbirds, because they're classic examples of animal ornamentation, and at least some of this is thought to result from sexual selection. In hummingbirds, females take on all parental care, so theoretically, it makes sense for us to expect lots of ornamentation in males. But due to their size, hummingbird behavior is still somewhat mysterious, and it turns out there's a lot we still don't know. For example, in many species of hummingbird, a proportion of females have some degree of quote-unquote male-like plumage colors. In fact, a colleague of mine, Ellie Diamant at UCLA, recently went through thousands of hummingbird specimens and found that out of 209 hummingbird species with sufficient data, nearly a quarter of them had female polymorphism. I decided to study one of these species, the white-necked Jacobin, shown here with a male on the left and a female on the right. When we started this project, we knew male-like females probably existed in this species, but not much else. We didn't know the frequency of male-like females, how similar they were to males, or even whether this was truly a polymorphism. The research I'm going to be presenting was entirely done in the town of Gamboa in Panama through the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. So one of the first things we started doing was to monitor the population of white-necked Jacobins in Gamboa. Throughout the project, we processed over 400 individuals, banding them, taking photographs, and taking blood samples for genetic sexing. A first step was to describe and observe plumage coloration. I won't go into too much detail, but just to summarize, we used a method which extracted nine color values from each individual and analyzed them using a principal components analysis. Here I'm showing the first two principal components, which together make up around 95% of the color variation. Females are represented as green circles and males as blue triangles. You can see that color in this species is clearly divided into two distinct types, and we verified this using objective cluster analysis. Importantly, notice that all males cluster together in the left side, but that females are present in both regions. We therefore refer to the color type on the left as male-like or androchrome, and the type on the right as drab or heterochrome. Overall, roughly 30% of females were drab and 70% were male-like. Just to give you a closer look at this species, on the top row I have what male white-necked jacobins look like, and on the bottom is what most females look like. Here again I'm showing the male in the top row, but now I'm showing one of the male-like females on the bottom. So the difference between these female types is really not subtle, and the male-like females really are male-like in at least their plumage. But there's still a missing piece to this puzzle. Since birds molt their plumage every year, could plumage color be somewhat plastic, or do individuals stay the same for their entire lives? To answer this question, we can use tiny lines on hummingbird bills, called corrugations, to estimate which individuals are juveniles. More corrugations is associated with younger age in hummingbirds. What I'm showing you here is a graph of the proportion of females in each plumage type at each corrugation level. Blue represents male-like plumage, and green represents drab. And what we see here immediately is that younger individuals on the left side of the graph are entirely male-like while older individuals are mostly drab. But you'll notice that no level of corrugation is entirely drab, indicating that about 20% of adult females also have male-like plumage. To look at this another way, what we're seeing here is that both female and male juveniles start out in plumage that is similar to adult males. Most females then shift to the drab type as adults, but about a fifth of them stay in the male-like form. 
Just to emphasize, this is the complete opposite of what you see in most sexually dimorphic birds, where juveniles usually look more like the adult female. So far, our banding data indicates that once Jacobins reach adulthood, they don't change their plumage type. One more thing to add here. Over the years, we've collected video and photos of several male-like females sitting and tending to nests, demonstrating that at least some male-like females are indeed reproductive. So besides being really unusual and intriguing, we can use the ontogeny of ornamentation in this species to infer something about its adaptive value. A potential adaptive hypothesis for female ornamentation could have something to do with sexual selection. In other words, male-like ornamented female plumage is adaptive because it is favored by male mating preference. If this were the case, one prediction we could make is that ornamentation in females would be most prevalent during the reproductive life stage. But as I showed, what we found is the opposite. In fact, what we see in this species is that female ornamentation is most likely to show up precisely during the non-reproductive life stage. Again, most females are ornamented when they are non-reproductive juveniles, then lose this plumage as adults. Since sexual selection can't act on individuals that are non-reproductive, it's unlikely that this is what female ornamentation is for. But you may be thinking, well, 20% of the adult females are still ornamented, so what about them? And also, sexual selection is all about mate preference, so what do males prefer? To answer this question, I did an experiment where I put two feeders next to each other in the wild, each with a taxidermy mount of a Jacobin. I had three different trial types, with each pairing combination of a male, a male-like female, or a drab female. So the result is a trial type with different sex and different color, same sex but different color, and different sex but same color. I then watched the feeders and waited for hummingbirds to approach and interact. When a Jacobin displayed either courtship or copulation behavior towards a mount, I recorded which they did this with first in each trial. So what did we end up finding? In trials with a male and a drab female, I found that in 100% of trials, Jacobins displayed courtship or copulation with a drab female first. In trials between a drab female and a male-like female, we see the exact same pattern, with 100% of Jacobins courting or copulating the drab female. In trials where both male and female type are the same male-like plumage type, we don't see an obvious preference. It's clear based on this data that Jacobins court and copulate these mounts based on color, not by genetic sex. Importantly, there's a strong preference for the drab females when they're present. So our second prediction for the sexual selection hypothesis is also incorrect. And taken together, the ontogeny of ornamentation in females and the strong sexual preference for drab females both indicate that sexual selection does not benefit the male-like females. So if not sexual selection, then what else? I decided to go back to these questions I asked at the beginning of the presentation. What exactly do female hummingbirds compete for? And if you've ever had the opportunity to watch hummingbirds, you know that they can be very aggressive with each other, especially around nectar resources. So I decided to do just that and watch who's chasing who around feeders. So this is the result of what I found. In this graph, what I'm showing is a comparison between the number of chases in which each color type of Jacobin chased another bird versus the number of times that type itself was chased. So on the left side, in green, I'm showing that male-like plumaged birds were more often chasers rather than the ones being chased, which is in blue. And on the right, drab females rarely chased other birds, again in green, but were often being chased by other birds, again in blue. To summarize, male-like individuals of unknown sex are more often aggressors, while drab females are more often chased. From these observations, we can propose an alternative hypothesis that ornamentation in this species is a signal of competitive ability or aggression. Ornamentation in both male and male-like females could be associated with aggressive behavior and the ability to access and defend limited resources. Now, if this were the case, we might expect other hummingbirds to avoid aggressive interactions with males and male-like females more than with drab females in order to avoid provoking a dangerous competitor. So this is what we wanted to test next. To answer this question, I'll show data from the same experiment with the paired taxidermy mounts. 
but this time, rather than sexual behaviors, I'll show you data on who the approaching birds decided to attack first. So, who tends to get attacked first? The percentages I'm showing here are the proportion of trials in which I saw an interacting hummingbird attack that mount type. We actually found a very similar pattern as to what we saw in sexual behavior. When there is a drab female mount present, she tends to get attacked first, regardless of whether the alternative is a male or male-like female. And between male-like females and males, we don't seem to see much of a difference at all. So this shows that birds visiting feeders direct their attacks based on color, not by genetic sex. And when drab females are present, they're usually the ones that get attacked first. This sets up the potential that a benefit to being a female with ornamented plumage is that they can avoid aggression. Now before we move on, I want to make one more point. In the previous slide, I showed the results from any hummingbird that attacked the taxidermy mounts, whether it was a Jacobin or another species. But do we see the same pattern in Jacobins and non-Jacobin species? Here I'm showing the same data as before, but this time with just non-Jacobins. Overall, we found no significant differences between the way Jacobins and non-Jacobins behave toward mounts. Doing pairwise comparisons was sometimes difficult because of low sample sizes, but you can see that the patterns are generally the same. Non-Jacobins tended to attack drab females first when they are present. I found this especially fascinating because it means that Jacobins are not the only ones paying attention to their coloration. Other species could be playing an important role in the evolution of female plumage. Back to our hypothesis for a competitive ability signal. A prediction that other hummingbirds avoid aggressive interaction with males and male-like females turns out to be true. But now the question is, does that potential result in a real benefit? This is a really difficult question to answer because we can't tell the difference between males and male-like females in the wild. To get around this issue, we used an RFID monitoring system. Individual Jacobins were fitted with a tiny electronic tag. When they visited feeders, we had equipped with an antenna, a data logger recorded the bird ID, the duration of its presence, and its location. We set up a network of these feeders all over the town of Gamboa, with some of the feeders containing high sugar content and others containing low sugar in order to simulate variation in resource quality. Over two years, we were able to collect data from 155 birds and over 80,000 logged visits. By using this data set, we were able to ask questions about whether male-like females actually have higher access to resources than drab females. We analyzed this in three ways. First, the probability of visiting high versus low sugar feeders. Second, the feeder visitation rate. And third, mean visit duration. All of these analyses used mixed effects models in order to account for random effects such as individual bird ID and feeder location. Males were included in this analysis, but for time's sake, I'm only presenting the data from females, which included 36 drab heterochrome females, or drab females, and 15 ornamented male-like females. First up, the probability of visiting high versus low sugar feeders. On the left side of the graph, you see the mean and confidence interval for drab females. And on the right side, you can see that male-like females are very similar. In a separate analysis, we did find that feeders were visited more often when they had high sugar levels. But this analysis shows that female types did not differ in their propensity to visit high quality feeders. What about feeder visitation rate? We found in this analysis that there does seem to be a difference between the female types, with male-like females showing higher visitation rates than drab females. Finally, we also looked at the average duration of each feeder visit. In this analysis, we included feeder sugar level as another explanatory variable, so the graph looks slightly different. On the x-axis, I'm showing high and low sugar feeders, and on the y, I'm showing the visit duration. Male-like females in blue do have overall longer visit durations, but this is most pronounced at the high sugar feeders. Remember that these feeders are preferred by all Jacobins, so the male-like females are benefiting the most at feeders with higher competition for axis. So going back to our hypothesis that male-like female ornamentation is a signal of competitive ability, it looks like there really is an associated benefit to accessing resources, especially when it comes to the frequency and duration of feeder visits. Now you may be asking yourself, are male-like females really just as aggressive as their male counterparts? In other words, is this an honest signal of competitive ability? That's an excellent question that can't be answered by the data I've presented in this paper 
But rest assured, we've looked into this in other studies. Just as a teaser, we don't think it's honest. So just to recap some of the main findings. First, we confirm that white-necked Jacobin females come in two types, male-like and drab. Second, juveniles of both sexes look like the adult males, which again is opposite of what you find in most sexually dimorphic birds. Most, but not all females then molt into drab plumage as adults. Finally, male-like plumage in females is most likely not used to attract mates. Instead, it's probably used in competition to gain access to food resources. We've also considered other hypotheses that I haven't been able to talk about today, but I'm happy to answer any questions afterward or in the Q&A. But what I'm most excited about is what we haven't been able to answer yet. There are so many more questions, but here are just a few I'm especially intrigued by. First, why does the polymorphism persist? So far, I've shown very few disadvantages to being male-like, so why is this plumage type still the minority in females? Second, what is the role of heterospecific behavior in the evolution of female plumage? While multiple species share an overlapping resource like nectar, we can't simply draw an arbitrary line at the species level if we want to think about resource competition. This is especially important in species-rich regions like the tropics, where niche sp space between species can overlap. Lastly, what is the mechanism, genetic or otherwise, that express ornamentation? Can variation in females give hints of how variation between sexes evolve with a shared genome? I think all of these questions are important, not just for understanding polymorphism, but also for the evolution of sexual dimorphism and signal evolution in general. I think hummingbirds have a lot to offer here. They compete intensely for multiple types of resources, not just for mates. As I've shown here, the result can be uniquely intriguing phenotypic evolution. With that, I'll finish up. I have lots of people to thank, but especially my former field assistants, funding, and lots of technical support. If you're at all interested, the study is in press and current biology, so keep an eye out if you'd like to read it in full. Thanks everyone again for stopping by.